Pastor Bob asked me to fill in and speak for him this morning. I hope that he and Tina are having a time of rest and relaxation. I'm sure they're going to come back just energized and rejuvenated to continue on. I spent a lot of time praying and trying to figure out exactly what I wanted to say, what God wanted to say to you. And uh, it's become a little bit of a personal message for myself that I want to just talk about some things that happened this week to me and leave you kind of with a word of challenge and a word of encouragement for this morning. Pamela made a comment to me just a week or two ago, and it was, I don't remember the exact phrasing of it, but it was something to the effect that we are only as effective as people as we understand who we are in God. That really our, our identity defines us. You're only as effective as you are self-confident in who you are. And that's a pretty general principle that we know just people in general, those who are effective either in business or in, as being entrepreneurs, whatever different situations they find themselves in, you, you come across those people that are just confident and they walk with an air of authority. And it's like anything they do is successful. It just happens for them. And I think that's true in the world. But those people, and for us, it's even more true when we know who we are in God, when we hear his voice, when we understand how much he cares for us and how much God wants us to succeed. Too often, I think we focus on ourselves and our own abilities, or our own lack of ability, or I'm not that smart, or I'm not, not that tall. I could never get a PhD. I could never study that much. I couldn't do this. I couldn't do that. For myself, growing up in school, I was always the shy, always the outcast, the picked on one. Uh, making friends, being in social situations was really difficult for me. And that carried through all the way throughout college and even into doing my internship with Chi Alpha in Montana. And Pamela and I were sitting through the missions training classes and all the psychological tests that they put you through and like what kind of personality do you have, extrovert, introvert, all those questions, your TJMFPQR number thing letters that you have to go through. And I was sitting there and like Pamela's like, oh, I love people. I love to talk to people. I'm an evangelist and I share God with people and I just love building relationships and everybody I come in contact with loves me and then we just have this instant connection like we've been friends for years and then I'm thinking about myself and then the guys are looking at me and they're like, so who are you? <laughs> and what do you do? I'm like, well, I'm, I'm kind of scared to stand up in public and speak. And uh, I'm not very athletic, like put me on a basketball court and everything thinks, everybody thinks because I'm 6'1", that it should just be natural. Well, no, that just means I'm a lot taller away from the ball and it bounces all over the place when I try and get it. And uh, I do like horses, but that's kind of like unusual by myself thing. I'd, I'd much rather get on a horse and take off by myself than be with a lot of people. In fact, after spending a weekend with people, I need a week to recuperate, rejuvenate myself. Where with Pamela, I've kind of got it figured out and starting to tell. If she starts to get a little snippy or you can tell she's just getting tired and run down at home, I'm like, Pamela, why don't you take a night and go out and be with people and have fun? And then everything shifts. And for her and I, we're totally opposite about that. But then... I'm, a, I'm supposed to be a minister and a pastor, but I'm doing this Chi Alpha thing. And when we went to Montana to do our inter internship, it was really challenging to, to focus on building relationship and to be involved one-on-one -on -one with guys. In fact, the requirement that Dick and Joy put on me when I was there is you have to go out and you have to start your own small group of eight other guys, and you can't take any of them from within Chi Alpha. You have to go find new people to do this with. And I'm like, how in the world am I going to do that? I have to walk up and talk to somebody. And, hey, you want to come be in my Bible study? And college students look at me, old guy, and they see old guy, and they hear Bible study in the same sentence. And they're like, I don't think so. I don't want to be a part of that. And so it's, it's been a huge challenge for me. This week we were sitting in our home. And I think, Chris, if you can put up like the second slide there. Let's go ahead and jump to the next one. This week, one of the things that we do for Kaiafa that we really love to do is inviting people over to our house. 
And uh, this week for our Friday night dinner, since my birthday is this coming Thursday, Pamela, unbeknownst to me, puts up on the Facebook invitation, hey, we're going to celebrate Michael's birthday. It's going to be our Shabbat Friday night dinner, but this is going to be the theme for it. And so she's inviting all these students over and they get there. And I'm thinking it's just one of our regular Friday night, let's have out, hang out, have fun kind of dinners. About halfway through the evening, she gathers everybody at the end of the family room and we're sitting around and she's like, okay, we're gonna take a time just to really bless Michael, to speak into his life the things that he has done for Chi Alpha. It was one of the most, I don't know, humbling moments in my life to hear what other people think about you. Because I know what I think about myself. And there's not a lot of quality there. I know the areas that I'm short in, building friendships with people, hanging out and playing pickup basketball. I mean, doing all the things that you think you have to do to be a good college pastor, that's just not me. As I was preparing for this and sitting at my desk this morning, I found this letter. And I'm really sharing all of this about myself, not to brag on myself or not to put myself down, but to leave this challenge for you. That we're probably very similar in the way we think about ourselves. And so I'm being very honest about how I think about myself. And then I want to show how God can still use that to accomplish his goals in his work in the kingdom. So this was a letter, a card that was written, I don't know, a year or so ago from one of our students who became a very integral part of our ministry, but who was very challenging to me to build relationship with. And she says, what an interesting road we've traveled together. From eye rolls and huffing about your conversations to brains transforming about Jewish ministry. We've had our fair share of laughs, debates, and sarcasm. It's been an awesome to share life with someone that gets my humor and appreciates my sarcastic nature. I've appreciated the way you have always looked out for me. You're definitely not my dad, but I know you'll always have my back. Thank you for teaching me so much what it means to be a godly man who is always willing to change and follow God because I didn't have that growing up. And it's been amazing to see in you. It's good to know that no matter how old you get, and I'm not saying that you're old, <laughs> that God continues to work in your life in amazing ways. I pray that God continues to show you what it means to be Jewish and what role you have in the kingdom. I'm excited to see your ministry go grow. P.S. Just so that you know, when I get married, you're officiating. So you better begin to work on that. Now, that was written, I don't know, a year ago or so. And just as a total side note, one of the crazy things about the way God works in our lives is uh, she jokes about me officiating her wedding. Well, next weekend, I'm conducting my first wedding. So I've been invited by some of our students to officiate for them. And then I read this this morning of what Jessica said, not even prophetically, but jokingly. I'm like, hey, God, you really are working that I get a chance to practice something that means so much in somebody's life to be able to perform that for them when they ask me to. And so God is just orchestrating so many different details that we're unaware of, that we don't know what's happening. Friday night in our house, we had 15 students or so representing seven different countries from around the world. So there was two students from Iran, there were three students from China. There was a student from India. There was a gentleman there from Ghana, Africa. There was, a, there was a young lady there from the Czech Republic in Europe. And we're all sitting there. And two of the really crazy things about this particular group of people, the way they came together on this Friday night, is most of them were not Christian. I mean, obviously, the two students from Iran, the guy from Pakistan, I mean, they are, they're not Christian students. But they are, um, they're, they're intricately involved in Chi Alpha. They call Chi Alpha their group. This is our thing. 
we own this. It's for us. We define what it is to be Chi Alpha. And they're not Christians. And they don't come to our worship service. They, only one of them has ever heard me teach or give a sermon before. And so we're sitting around as a group of people, and they're starting to share about me and what I've meant in their life. The other really crazy thing about this is, is just the way God plans and orchestrates everything. That they've never heard me preach a sermon, but everything that they said was about Christ. And so, one of the young ladies, young lady from Iran, starts sharing about how I've been involved in her life, and that she was moving one afternoon, trying to get out of a house on campus and move to a different apartment building, and I go over with our minivan, all the seats pulled out of it to grab all of her stuff, and she's using, she had all of her pots and pans packed into a suitcase, and all of her clothes thrown in a giant box, and everything is just kind of, you know, college student falling all over the place. I, I've just got this carload of things I gotta get out of one house and moved over to another house. And uh, I, we get everything loaded up, and we pull out of the driveway, and we're headed down the street just a few blocks from here to come down region toward campus, and she just loses it, starts crying. And I'm like, and I don't know what to say. I, I, just sitting there, listening to her cry for about five minutes until she can finally pull herself together and share a little bit about how horrible and tough the situation has been with her roommates. And I, I don't, didn't have any advice to give her. All, all I could do was sit there and listen. Couldn't fix the situation, didn't have anything to speak into it, but just to sit there and listen and drive her over to her new place and help her carry all of her things up the elevator five trips to get everything into her new apartment. And she's sitting here Friday night talking about how when she finds somebody who she wants to marry sometime way, way in the future, she says, that I've raised the bar on what it is to be a man and a husband in her eyes of the kind of person that she's looking for to marry. I'm like, I don't know. I mean, it's like we hang out, we do social stuff together. I've helped her move. We, she comes to our house and plays with my kids all the time. She's never heard me preach. She's never heard me teach. She's never, I mean, it's just such a different relationship with her than with all the other students. I mean, it's not my teacher pastor role in my life with her. Uh, the other young lady in the, the black tank top with the floral dress there is from the Czech Republic. She grew up, Europe has a predominantly Catholic background. So even if you're completely unreligious, you've probably seen some of the old cathedrals that are thousands of years old, or you've been to a mass before. And she's come to a few of our, she came to a lot of our worship services on campus. Uh, she came to our baptism service at the end of the year. And after the baptisms, we're walking back from Picnic Point and she's asking me questions about who, how can you be Jewish and be a Christian? That doesn't make any sense to me. And then what is this baptism thing? I, I thought like as a baby, you sprinkle water and put a cross on their head with oil or something. I mean, just, she has all these traditional perspectives of what it is to be a religious person. And as we're walking back from Picnic Point, she's like just inquisitive about who am I and how does this work and how does it fit together? And like, hey, why don't we get together for coffee later this summer and you can ask me and quiz me. And it ended up that we did hang out at Starbucks one afternoon. And so sharing my testimony, my story, being Jewish, growing up in a Christian school, having no religion in my house, all the different things that make up who I am. And sitting here Friday night and sharing with her interaction with me, she's like, you made religion real to me. I've grown, I've, grown up, I've grown up Catholic. I've gone to mass and I totally hated God. I hated religion. It, it, it wasn't, it didn't mean anything to me. In fact, I'm an atheist. I don't even believe in God because of my upbringing in the church that I experienced in Europe. But being a part of Chi Alpha, of Chi Alpha she's like, you've made it all made sense to me. So that's the other unique thing about this group of people. And the other thing that I really wanted to point out is our presentation of the gospel is not necessarily because we stand up and preach a sermon. 
It's because we live life with people. It's because we interact with them on a different level in our houses. And everybody this evening is sharing about what they think about me and my interaction with them. And I'm thinking in the back of my head how I'm supposed to be teaching and preaching. And here's the four spiritual laws. And here's the gospel road. And you're going to hell if you don't get saved. And all these things are in the back of my mind. And just waiting for the opportunity to ask them, so do you want to pray to receive Jesus in your heart? And it's like, it is not about all of that stuff. It's about hanging out at my house on Friday nights and having barbecues. The picture at the top there, we're praying and we're getting ready for dinner and, uh, and all these students from all these different company countries. And, and I have the thought, our, our theme for the evening was taco bar. So we had invited everybody to Shabbat dinner and we're going to have a big burrito taco bar. And so I'm like, oh, wait a second. And I think Pamela and I had the same thought at the same time. And she asked me, I wonder if our students from China or if our friend from India even knows what a burrito is or how to make one. And we've got beans and rice and cheese and tomatoes and the whole spread out on the counter with a pile of tortillas. And your people are kind of looking at it like, what do I do with this food? And what is it? What am I supposed to do with it? So I'm standing up there explaining to all the friends that are there, here's how you make a Mexican burrito. You grab the tortilla and you spread some beans on it and you pile on all your cheese and meat and tomatoes and salsa and jalapenos and everything that you want on in it and you roll it up and for our students from China, you roll it up the same way that you roll a spring roll. <laughs> oh, okay, that makes sense. I, th I think I can figure it out and do that then. And so we let everybody loose and they just kind of stand back and watch what different people from different countries pick and choose to put in their burrito and, and what they think they would like and everything in it. And I was sitting and watching Pamela just, I don't know, yesterday or the other day? Well, we went to Farmer's Market yesterday. And as we're walking back at the end of the day, Pamela and I are kind of in the back with our four kids walking 10 or 15 feet in front of us. And she just makes the comment, look what we've created. <laughs> and I think she meant that in the really physical, spiritual sense of, of look what we've created and how we've invested in their lives and how the four of them at that particular moment were getting along and holding hands and helping each other walk down the street and it was like something clicked and it actually worked. And I'm sitting and watching Pamela yesterday, I think, is sitting at the dinette table with Elijah, or no, with Halea, one of them, and goes gets, she goes and gets a box of vanilla wafers out of the cabinet and gets a couple of small cups and fills the cups with, what would you put in the cup? Milk. And she brings the cups over to the table and she's like, here's how you eat a vanilla wafer. You know, at the heart of the whole thing about Christianity, that's what discipleship is. It's teaching somebody how to roll a burrito. Or teaching your kid how to dip a wafer in milk. This is how you eat a vanilla wafer. Halia knows how to eat an Oreo cookie. You open it up, you scrape the filling out with your teeth, and you throw the rest of it away. <laughs> Discipleship is about the small things that we pass on in people's lives. And it's about being in the life situations where you can have the opportunity to teach those small things. The students were able to sit around and talk about me and my investment in their lives, not because I stand up on Thursday nights and preach at them, but because I invite them to my house to learn how to eat burritos. A very famous monk from the Middle Ages St. Francis of Sissy said once that <clears throat> preach the gospel all of the time. And if you need to, use words. Now, too often, we've taken that quote and we've eliminated the necessity to use words. That we think just because of our friendship that we're evangelizing somebody and presenting the gospel to them. And we are. But I don't want to misuse that quote and think that we don't need to preach. 
Christina from the Czech Republic knew who I was because I shared my testimony with her about being Jewish, about being raised in a Christian church, about how Judaism and Christianity mesh with each other, about what the gospel is. She came to a baptism service. She had the whole picture of what it is to be washed clean of our sins and raised again in a new life with Jesus and him filling her heart, your heart. And the picture of it and the teaching throughout a semester made sense to her. So the two things have to go together. But the reason that I was able to share that with her is because I invited her to my house and taught her how to eat challah bread and roll a burrito and have Shabbat sushi night, which is the most crazy contradiction in terms that you can think of when you stop to think about it. And so all of these times that she was in my house gave me an opportunity to invite her to Starbucks and talk about the gospel. So it's preaching from our life that opened up the opportunity to share about the message. And those two things have to go together with each other. Sometimes we try to use words, but we haven't had an opportunity to be open in a person's life. Sometimes we limit our life experiences to friendship, and then we're, I'm so afraid that it's going to ruin our friendship if I ever say anything about Jesus to them. The two have to go together of building a life with a person and sharing the witness of the gospel with the person. So I want to focus a little bit on discipleship this morning. And on the next slide there, just the Hebrew word for disciple is Talmudim, uh, the plural, disciples. That Jesus was a disciple of his Father in heaven. Everywhere that he went, everything that he did, the only things that he did do was what he heard the Father in heaven telling him to do. That his relationship was so secure, his intimacy was so perfect with God that he knew where to go and what to say. Before he picked the 12 disciples, he went up on a mountain and prayed over a night to come back the next morning and know exactly which guys God was leading him to. In fact, Nathaniel, God didn't even lead him to Nathaniel. God turned it around and said, hey, Nathaniel, go find Jesus. And Jesus says, I saw you sitting under the fig tree, and I know the experience that you were having at that moment. God picked you out for me, not I picked you out. I mean, Jesus was so in tune with the spiritual aspect of what was going on, even in picking his 12 disciples, that some of them came walking up to him. In fact, most of them did. Hey, I know you're the Christ, and we've been with John the Baptist and following his teaching, but you're the guy. And you're the one that we're going to follow. Because of that night in prayer, the work of picking the 12 was easy. They walked up to him. And Jesus only had to weed out which ones are you supposed to follow me. And he spends the next year, year and a half, three years with them, teaching them, walking around every day, having a fish, fish fry over a campfire on the beach, hanging out in the middle of the desert, looking up and counting the stars in the middle of the night, doing, doing all those life experiences that you do when you go hiking with a person for three years and you're camping out and eating fires, eating food over the campfire. Jesus is that example to us of being in that personal, perfect relationship with God. That above everything, he was obedient. In Matthew 5, it kind of goes through this whole thing of Jesus' obedience that I came not to destroy the Torah, but to fulfill it, to carry it out, to obey every commandment. <clears throat> John, the gospel writer, in his letter of 1 John, picks that up and says, If you love me, you will obey my commandments. And so obedience becomes a huge cornerstone in our relationship with God as a disciple. That if we're not obeying the things that he asked us to do, written throughout the whole Bible, then we don't really love God. And so we want to talk about grace, which God is a God of grace, and he gives us a lot of leeway and a lot of freedom to figure out our lives and to live our life with him. But we can't rely on grace for an absence of obedience. In Matthew 22 is a whole passage about the Pharisees come up and they're trying to trap Jesus in another trick question. Okay, so you're obedient and we have all these commandments that we're supposed to obey. Which one is the most important commandment? And Jesus picks the first one, which is actually the first of the Ten Commandments when you 
read that introductory sentence to love God. I am the Lord your God. That's the first commandment. And in Deuteronomy, it says, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength. And so Jesus picks up a Torah commandment and says that is the most important commandment that you're supposed to observe and supposed to obey, to love God. Everything else flows out of that. Just like our own kids. I mean, when we ask our kids to take the garbage out at night and they, they stomp their foot and they slam the cabinet door and they grab the bag and they rip a hole in it and it drips garbage all across the kitchen floor and they finally get the bag out to the garbage can and they say, there, I obeyed you. And you're like, um, <laughs> that doesn't cut it. I mean, I'm glad you did the job, but that didn't mean anything. And God looks at us the same way. And I think, unfortunately, we react to God the same way sometimes. Like God tells you, go buy an extra gallon of milk and walk across the hall to your neighbor and give it to him. And you're like, I don't, know, I don't have any money. I can't do that. And are you serious? I'm, I'm late for work and I, there's no way I can take that extra two minutes to do that today, God. Are you serious? Okay, fine. Just because you told me to, I'm going to go and do it, God. Damn it. Amen. <laughs> and God's like, well... Yeah, I don't know if I can thank you for that obedience or not. <laughs> the verse specifically, God loves a cheerful giver. They were, they were supposed to give out of, a ben, of, a, of abundance. And even when we give out a sacrifice, it's still cheerfully. It's still because, God, I know you've given me so much. And I know even if I give away the last bit of money that I have, you're going to take care of me. And so I'm cheerfully going to give this away expecting to see the miracle that you're going to do to take care of me because of it, because I just know that's the way it works. And so our obedience flows out of love. We're not obedient to God because he's put a requirement on us, but we're obedient to the things he asks us to do because we know how much he loves for us and cares for us. And that's the definition of what a disciple is. Obedience out of love. Because we were loved, then we obey. The Great Commission, Matthew 28, go into all the world making disciples, teaching them everything that I've commanded you and baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. In English, our verb tenses get mixed up. And from our Dick and Jane books in second grade, as we were growing up, we learned that the English word go is a verb. Go to the store. And so we read this sentence, and it says, go make disciples. Well, it, what's the verb? Go. What's make? It's just one of those helping verbs. And in English, we get that all turned around. Well, if you read it in the original Greek, or even in the original Hebrew, then it's much more like Spanish, or French, or a lot of other languages, where when you conjugate verbs, the tenses play out differently. And if you read this sentence in the original language, you'll recognize that go is not the verb of the sentence. The word order and the verb tenses make disciples is the main clause. So in English, a more understandable translation might be, while going into all the world, make disciples. What's the key idea when you say the sentence that way? Make disciples as you're going throughout all the world living your life. And so the great commandment, the keynote commissioning of ourselves and what we're supposed to do is not go into all the world and live a happy life. What we're commanded to do is make disciples as we're traveling throughout the, all the world. And what are we supposed to teach our disciples? Everything that God commanded us to do. Not everything that we've learned about Jesus, but everything the Father commanded us to do. 
Where are the Father's commandments? They're in the Old Testament. So Jesus lives out this perfect example of being obedient, of letting his obedience flow out of his overwhelming love for the Father, and passing on that teaching to everybody that he comes in contact with. First to the twelve. Jesus walked around as a teacher, which in his cultural setting, there was a lot of teachers. There was a lot of different schools of thought and all these little bands, all these little tribes of disciples. Like John the Baptist was one, and then Jesus comes along and becomes one. And all these Pharisaical schools, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Scenes, and they all have their individuals within the group that are walking around and teaching each other. So every time a Pharisee comes up and challenges Jesus, well, we've heard it said that this is the way this verse is taught. What do you say about it? And they had two purposes in mind. The one that's revealed in the New Testament is they were trying to trap him and getting him to break one of God's commandments in the way he interpreted the verse. But the other thing is, those questions and that interchange of, well, we say this, what do you say? That was normal. That was what all of the different teachers were doing as they traveled around that day. So they had their group of students that faithfully followed them around like little puppy dogs. And you see that with Jesus and his 12 disciples. Peter just lapping along, trying to do the best that he can do. And sometimes he totally stumbles over himself and says something really dumb. John getting all angry, fighting with his brother, the Sons of Thunder, all of their misdeeds and mishaps as they interact with each other. They're just this little group following Jesus around, trying to learn the best that they can what's going on. And John the Baptist still had his followers that were following him. In fact, later in the story, John the Baptist sends some of those guys when he's in prison to go ask Jesus. This is a year or so after Jesus picked the 12 disciples. And so John the Baptist still had his group. And Jesus has his group, and, and they're, they're interacting with each other. So if there was a common cultural thing that you pick a teacher, and then you follow him around and learn everything that he has to teach you. Uh, the Hebrew word Talmud, Talmudim for disciple, uh, one translation of it is remembering one. Because they literally memorize everything that the person is teaching, and then they're able to pair it, to repeat it back again after they've heard it. Which is why later in uh, Romans, I think it is, or maybe later in John, in John, when Jesus promises the gift of the Holy Spirit to come into your life, who will help you remember everything that you've learned from me. So another aspect of a disciple is the remembering one, the one who remembers what they've learned from Jesus and is able to teach it to another person. On the next, so a loyal subject who obeys the king. On the next slide there, a disciple is also a student who learns. And we kind of covered that a little bit in just what I was just saying, that they have a group of people that are following Jesus around and learning everything that he learns. Why were there 120 people in the upper room? Or where do they come up with that number, 120? Jesus had 12 disciples that are following him around. And it's much the same as what I shared at the very beginning. When I went to Montana, my mentor, who was discipling me, challenged me to go find eight other people who I was going to disciple. And as I was discipling them, or what I do on campus here, each one of the guys that I'm working with, is I challenge them, okay, I'm meeting with you here at Starbucks, and we'll do that for a semester by ourselves, but next semester, I expect you to go find three more people that you're meeting with me. So you meet with me on Tuesday, and I expect you to go meet with three other guys on Thursday. And then after you meet with them for a semester and they start to get the hang of it and learn the Bible and learn the discipleship and learn who Jesus is and learn about his love, I want you to challenge them to go find three more people. So you meet with me on Tuesday and you meet with them on Thursday and you challenge them to go meet with somebody else on Friday. And then it keeps on going and going and going and going and going and going. 
So Jesus has his 12 guys. And he's told each one of them, you better go find 10 more. And all of a sudden, there's 120 of them in the upper room that have been learning about Jesus for the last year and a half. So that on the day of Pentecost, they can all show up in the temple courts and be filled with the Holy Spirit and empowered. And Jesus, or Peter stands up and gives his big sermon. And then all of a sudden, 120 people take off around the countryside. And they're teaching and teaching and teaching and teaching more and more and more and more. Uh, Matthew 13 and Matthew 15, the common phrase and both of those verses, they follow right after or right before Jesus, Jesus teaches a parable. And so he gives this public presentation of a parable, a story that gives a kingdom principle. And then he turns to his disciples or he turns to the group of people with him. And he's like, do you hear and understand what I've been trying to teach you? It is a key phrase that pops up that a student is one who learns. It's not just that you heard the story, but do you know what the story meant? And are you able to go teach it to somebody else? So a disciple is one who learns. A disciple is somebody who lives a life of righteousness. Matthew 5, 6, one of the Beatitudes. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness shall be filled. It's hard for me to teach anything to anybody if I haven't learned it for myself. Pamela's challenge of me a week or so ago of how much do I really believe that God loves me? How much do I really have faith that he wants to work through me and do the best through me? I so limit myself because I'm focused on my own abilities rather than focused on what God wants to do through me that I couldn't even imagine sitting in a room Friday night and having all these people say all of this stuff about me of how I've impacted their life over the last year, over the last two years. And I'm like, it just blows me away. Of, of the thing that I thought I was the weakest in are the things that people are coming back and saying, that's what you did for me in my life. Ping is a brand new student a brand new Christian from China. He's been a part of our group for about a year and a half now. Uh, he came to our Chinese New Year's celebration, and then he's just kind of stuck with us ever since then. He went through the Father Heart of God teaching that we did, and uh, as we're sitting there in the prayer time afterwards, and Pamela and I, it's our turn to go pray for him and pray words of encouragement into his life, and I, we walk up to him, and I'm like, wait a second, I think there's a more basic question. Ping, how are you doing? What did you think about the conference? Who, how, what do you think about Jesus? Who do you think Jesus is? And he's like, well, I've always known about Confucius. And Confucius is a really good teacher. But Jesus actually died for me. And I'm like, Pamela and I are just kind of, well, I was ready to give the whole gospel message. And, and can we pray for you to get saved? And, and, and I have all these questions in my back of my mind. And I don't even get to ask the questions. He just starts spitting it out. And we're like, so, Ping, what do you want to do? What does that mean to you that Jesus died for you? And he's like, well, I, I think I need Jesus to be my Savior. And I'm like, well, can we pray for you? Can we, can we lead you in a prayer? Do you know what you want to do? Or what do you have to do? He's like, yeah, I, I think I need to ask Jesus to live in my heart. Well, do you need us? Do you know what to say? Can we help? No, I, I think I can do it by myself. <laughs> like, okay, well, do you want to pray, man? Yeah, sure. And so he just sits there and starts praying. And I, I don't even get to tell him what to say. He just, can you please repeat after me the sinner's prayer? Like, no, it all makes, he already got it all. Jesus had already done the work. The Holy Spirit had already taught him in his mind and in his heart what he needed to do and what he needed to say. And all he needed was the opportunity to do it for himself. And I didn't have to, do, I didn't get, I didn't get to do anything except sit there and watch. And he stands up Friday night and he's like, I'm so thankful that I got to meet you in Pamela. And I don't know, I probably have, but it hasn't been a conscious thing. I don't know that I've ever used the word disciple with pig. I've never said, you are my disciple. I've never said, come and learn what I have to teach you about God. I was like, I've always, hey, would you want to come and hang out at Starbucks with me? And we've got this little book that we'll work through. Like, yeah, I'd love to. And we sit there, and we go through this little, like the green book, the purple book thing, and we learn about God. 
and he uh, he wrote a birthday card for me, and he's sitting down there Friday night, and he's like, I'm so glad that I get to be a disciple of Jesus. I've learned what the truth is about being a disciple. And that that's the words that he chose to use that I don't think I've ever said with him. And again, one of the areas, building relationship with guys and trying to draw them into an intimate relationship with God. And guys are intimate. Wives know that's just, that's a challenging word to get a guy to figure out. And then you want me to be intimate with this person, God, can't even feel, touch, know, out there somewhere thing. You want me to be intimate with God? I'm trying to figure out my own emotions as a man. And you want me to be emotional with God, do I have a hard time feeling and touching? Well, yeah, let's figure it out together. And here's Ping saying how thankful that he was to be a part of that in my life in an area that I struggled with so hard myself. And God just drawing people together because that's what God wants to do if I would quit putting myself down and being weak in that area. On the next one, just uh, two more, I think. Oh, back up one, sorry. A disciple is somebody who puts faith into action. Again, our English language kind of loses the sense of the word faith when it gets translated out of the original Hebrew because we think of faith as a noun. Do you have faith? Can I measure it? Can I define it? Do you have it? But in Hebrew, faith is a verb. And so it'd be better thinking, are you faithful or do you faithfully live your life? Because faith is something that you do. It's not something that you have. I know that God exists. That's not faith. That's knowledge because of experience or because of choice, because I've made a decision. God exists. It's a statement of truth. It's not necessarily faith. Faith is what you do with that. Faith is how you act it out. Okay, because I know God exists, I'm going to exercise my faith in the way I live. Matthew 25 is the parable of the talents. One guy gets five talents, one guy gets two talents, one guy gets one talent. The first two guys do something with their talents. They invest it. They make a profit on it. They bear fruit because of the investment that was given into them. And they have more talents to give back to Jesus when he shows up to collect. The third guy goes and buries his talent, his money in the ground and does nothing with it. He didn't even have enough faith to put the talent in the bank and earn a little bit of interest. He didn't, he didn't have any faith in the banking system that he was going to get something as a return. Which in our current climate of the stock market is totally understandable, but he didn't, he didn't even try. He didn't do anything with it. He buried it. His faith was never put into action. And when Jesus came back to collect, he's like, sorry, I didn't do anything. True with each one of us. Our key verse in Chi Alpha comes from 2 Corinthians 5.20. And as you read through that whole paragraph there, there's two phrases that stick out really big to me. And one of those is that God has given us the ministry of reconciliation and he has given us a message of reconciliation. That's Paul writing to the Corinthians as a whole group in the city of Corinth. And so the letter is very applicable. It could have been Paul writing to all the people in Madison gathered in the church of Capital City. And he says, I have given you both the ministry and the message of reconciliation. That God has given to every one of us a message. Something that we can share in people's lives. Your message is your story. When I was sick with the flu and heaving and couldn't get out of bed for three days, God showed up and healed me. When I couldn't pay the electric bill, somebody put a check in the mailbox and I had enough money. When my kids were acting out and I had no idea how to control them, all of a sudden I had this thought and I knew what to do. When this was happening in my life, God showed up in this way and did this for me. Do every one of you have some God story that you can tell? 
That at some point, somewhere in your life, God did something. Go tell someone about it. On campus, I can walk up to a student and I can ask them, do you think God is real? 90% of the time on our campus, they'll say no. And I can say, well, do you remember in your philosophy class, there's the teleological and there, there's all these philosophical proofs about why God could be real that the philosophers have come up with, Kant and Emmanuel and Descartes and, and all these guys. And we can sit down and we can have an argument and we can have a discussion about why God is real. And I can prove that God is real. And they'll look at me and say, well, no, I, I just don't believe it. That doesn't work. I, I don't care. I mean, maybe that's true, but it doesn't mean anything in my life. So what? Or I can walk up to a student and I say, do you think God is real? And they're like, well, no. I'm like, okay, well, can I share a story that happened in my life? I was getting ready to go to Montana, and I had to quit my job. My wife and I both had to quit our jobs, and we had to come up with $3,000 a month that people were gonna support us to go take this special class that we wanted to take in Montana. So we both quit our jobs in order to get $3,000 a month. And we started praying and asking God, where in the world is this money gonna come from? And we had some financial investors that were very rich that we thought were gonna give us the money. So we went and asked them for the money and they said, no, I don't think I'm gonna invest in that. That doesn't seem like a worthy cause. It's not what I wanna do. So we're like, God, what are we gonna do? Where are we gonna get the money from? And we pray some more and we start visiting with people and all of a sudden people that we didn't know had never met before people that were poor and had no money to give us started giving us twenty dollars a month and a hundred dollars a month and after three or four months of praying to god all of a sudden we had enough people that were willing to invest three thousand dollars a month in us so we could go take these special classes that we wanted to do God showed up because he, we prayed and the money started coming in from people that we had never met, never had any connection with. We get random phone calls and random people and random places just, hey, here's the, here, I, I want to invest in this class that you're taking. I think it's a really worthwhile thing that you go and do this and I want to help you with the tuition to be able to do it. And so here you go. And the student looks at, back at me and is like, yeah, but I don't believe God exists. Well, I don't care if you believe God exists or not. Look what he just did for me. Do you want to hear another story and another story and another story and another story and another story? Look at all these things that God did. And if you want to come on Thursday night, I have a room full of 50 people. And each one of them will tell you five or six stories about what God did in their life. And so you cannot believe in God if you want to. But all these people have stories about God, what God's doing in their life. So I challenge you, why don't you just spend the next two weeks praying and asking God to answer that question that you've never had answered before and see if God shows up and answers the question for you. And they come back two weeks later and like, my knee was healed or God did this or this person said that. I can't believe how many stinking people I keep running into this week. They keep telling me God is real and I'm, I don't want to believe it, but all these people keep coming up and tell me and I'm, that's never happened before. I've been in school for eight years and all of a sudden I can't get away from God and I don't know what's going on in my life. So if you have a story, go steer the story. Because I've, come, I've told some student to come find you and then get a God story from you. So you better have one. So that they can come back and tell me that God is real because somebody told him about him. Okay? So God has given all of us a message to share with people. Something that's happened in our lives. Our story is his story that he wants to share through us. It also said that God has given us a ministry of reconciliation. For me, Friday night, my ministry of reconciliation was teaching a house full of international students how to roll a Mexican burrito. The week before, it was how to eat shredded barbecue beef and put it on a loaf of challah bread. And the most amazing thing about a big crock pot full of barbecue shredded beef is when you scoop up all the sauce out of the bottom of it and pull it. And I'm like, oh, wow. <laughs> I didn't know anything could be so good in my whole life. Hey, do you want to hear about Jesus? Because they got to eat some good barbecue beef. 
And I think there's several of you in this room that have the ministry of backyard barbecue. Some of you have the ministry of come have coffee at Caribou with me. Some of you have the ministry of, I heard your car broke down, can I give you a ride to work today? Some of you have the ministry of, I know that you need a ride to the grocery store and you're an international student trapped on campus, so can I take you to Super Walmart? Have you ever seen a place like Kohl's before? Or have you ever had the chocolate chip cookie dough crunch at Culver's? I mean, I don't know what your ministry is, but I know the Bible says God's given every one of you a ministry. And so be creative and figure out what it is and start using it. I would have never ended up with a room full of international students telling me what a wonderful person I was if I didn't invite them over to dinner at my house on a weekly basis. And so what I thought was so hard boiled down to invite five people to your house for dinner and they're going to tell you what an amazing person you are. <laughs> I mean, God knew what I needed to hear. God knew that they, that they needed to hear about Jesus. God knew that we all had fun hanging out and having fun and trying different kinds of food. And he put it all together so that it could work out to share in their life the way, they, the way it all needed to work out. On the next slide, the last one that I want to highlight, it says that a disciple is a disciple of forgiveness, lives a life of forgiveness. Uh, Matthew 18 is, again, the parable of the, the rich ruler and the servant, and the servant has a debt that he can't pay, and he gets the debt forgiven, and the rich guy has a debt and doesn't forgive, and you can read the whole story there, and it's just the whole principle that we live a life of forgiveness. In, uh, in Chi Alpha, we turn it around, and we're not turn it around, but we express it in the idea that we live an unoffendable life. So that no matter what anybody does to me, we've made a commitment with the people in Chi Alpha that we know you have my best interest at heart. And I'm making that commitment to you that I have your best interest at heart. So if I hurt you for some reason, I didn't mean to. And I expect you to not be offended over it. Hurt, yes. Come tell me I did it, yes. Allow me the opportunity to ask for forgiveness. But we live an undefendable life. And that's a two-way street. That means I choose not to be offended by what other people do to me. And I choose, they choose to allow me forgiveness when I offend somebody else. So there's that mutual reciprocity back and forth between the two of us. That no matter what happens, we may have a fight, we may have a disagreement, we may, have, we, we may hurt each other, but we're going to find a way to work through it because we made that commitment to each other. So we live a life of forgiveness. Because it says in James that if you want to be healed, confess your sins to one another so that you can be whole, so that you can be healthy. And then finally we live a life of humility. The stories that I've shared about myself are not bragging on myself. That I really wanted to highlight my own sense of insecurity, my own sense of shortcoming in my life. That, that I, I'm introspective enough to know where I don't measure up to God's standard. Or to my kid's standard, or my wife's standard. But it's not about where I don't measure up. And it's not about sitting in a room full of international students who have a bunch of great things to say about me. Because yes, through God, I was able to interact in amazing ways in their lives, but it was because of through God. They only see a limited picture of me, of what I share on Friday nights. And so I still might have the tendency, well, they really don't know the real me. They only know the me that I show, my Chi Alpha face. But God wants to work through us. He wants us to be humble. He wants us to be transparent in sharing our shortcomings with each other. He wants us to be transparent in sharing our celebrations with each other. 
that we can learn from one another. I know what I'm not skilled in, and I'm so thankful that Pamela is the relational, interactive person that holds that aspect of Catholic together, that the two of us can work together as a team because we know where we complement each other and able to work together. That you guys, as a group of people here, and the many that are missing today, are starting to learn and to understand where your different strengths are. When, when we, as a church, pull off International Thanksgiving dinner and are able to, some people carpool and some people set up tables and some people vacuum the floor afterwards and some people cook and some people do the dishes and some people sit at a table and are great at conversation and are table hosts with them and <laughs> able to interact and dialogue and build, a, build those crazy balloon turkeys because you've got that gift of craft and creativity and all the different skills an right, international Thanksgiving dinner that we do as a church is a great example of how each one of us lives up to the individual ministry that God has gifted each one of us with and is able to impact the lives of a hundred students that come to hear and learn about what Thanksgiving is and get an opportunity to hear about Jesus and about love at the same time. That happens here in the church as a group and it can happen in your house as a family or in your book club, or in your office space, or in any other situation that you find yourself. As we walk a life of humility to be open, to share with one another, hey, I'm really not so good at talking to people, but I know you're a great conversationalist, so I have a car, you can talk, why don't we take this person to coffee? <laughs> and, Start finding ways to, to interact with each other, to live out our life of faith, to, to put our knowledge about God into action in a way that touches the people around us so that we can be obedient to the things that God's asking us to do. I'm going to ask Chris to come and play another song for us with us. I want you to do two things. <coughs> Take out the notepad application on your smartphone or a pen and paper. And I want you to write down three things. The first thing, and just the first thing, just a couple of words to trigger a thought. What's a story? about something that God has done in your life? What is the word of reconciliation that God's given you? What's the story? What's something that God's done for you? Just a couple of sentences or a couple of words to jog that idea. The next time you run into somebody and you're talking about God and you're going to be like, hey, I remember the time that God did this for me. The second thing that I want you to write down is what are your hobbies and likes? What things do you like to do? Art, cooking, horseback riding, shopping, drinking coffee, going to the art fair, going to a fancy restaurant, sitting in the backyard with a book and your feet up on a lounge chair. What is it that you like to do? Pulling weeds in the yard, pruning trees, working in the garage, tearing your car apart. Whatever things you're writing down or think of that you write, like to do right now, your challenge is invite somebody to come do that with you. And while they're doing that with you, Tell them about number one that you wrote down. And then third, let's close with just a moment of worship. And uh, first of all, in your thoughts, honor God for who he's, he's created you to be. That thought challenges you. Read Psalms 139 as we're walking worshiping right now. And then out of the overflow of who God created you to be, you're able to carry out the first two things. Thank you.
forget what I heard yesterday. And so writing it down and having a chance in my notes, set an alarm on your reminder to pop up on Thursday. Oh yeah, the guy, I don't remember his name, he said something like da-da-da-da. Oh yeah, I wrote that down in a note. What was that I wrote down? Read it again Thursday and remind yourself. And did you do it yet? So when you're ready, go ahead and stand and worship with me. Father, I just praise you and I thank you for this morning. God, I pray a blessing over Bob and Tina. God, I pray that you will uh, restore their hearts, speak your peace and your strength into their lives. I pray that their bodies are renewed in rest and strength this weekend. Father, all the activities they've been involved in, I pray that your peace would overshadow all of it. God, throughout this week, I just pray that you would draw them deeply into your presence. Father, that you would birth new plans, new messages, new ideas in their lives. Father, give them the skill of pastoring and pouring out their hearts over the rest of our lives. Father, I just pray that they would come back renewed and refreshed with a new passion in your presence. Father, I pray a blessing over this congregation. Father, that your spirit and your presence would be here. God, that as we obey your command, as we follow your heart's passion, that as the Father sent you, Jesus, you are sending us out. And we are full of your spirit and your love and your compassion. God, I pray as Psalm says, that you would be the lifter of our eyes, that our focus would be on you, that we would see your face shining brightly in our vision, and that our eyes would be off of ourselves. Father, I thank you for your spirit in each one of us. God, let your spirit rise up within us, that we're full of your peace, that we're full of your skill, of your love. Father, I thank you that even in our shortcomings, you've made that an opportunity to connect with people. So Jesus, I just pray strength and peace over each one.